when our folks end up in the cage because we know our people are uh, having more interactions with the police. I mean, you go to any club on any given night, you know, the pol it's deeply uh, policed. Um, one time we were at a having a, a gathering in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and all of us, you know, rolled up into a club. And afterwards, you know, it's gay night. We turned up, we kicking it. And afterwards, um, the police were out there deep and maced and just started macing people to clear the crowd. And folks are like, this is a common occurrence, you know? And because I think that there is, in some places where there is, where there could be very much a strong, you know, fight to end police violence or what have you, that when folks other, the queer and trans folks that are experiencing it, you don't have, it becomes so normalized, you know? Like no one is out there fighting uh, for this. So that's why we must, you know, fight for ourselves and then also draw the connections across communities. That's like, yo, you getting, you know, you getting your ass kicked and so are we. You know, we have a shared interest in fighting together, which is one of the things that's important for us is to bring folks into rooms who should be allies and who should be working together. Um, and so, yeah, I think we're, and I think it's also important too, um, in New Orleans, there was some really dope work um, being done by Women with the Vision um, and other comrades there, especially around the way um, um, trans women in particular, even here in Atlanta, are being criminalized just for having condoms in the purse and like assuming that folks are doing sex work. You know, sex work is real work, no shade on that. But folks are, um, yeah, being pushed into cages off of an assumption that because you are trans, you're automatically doing sex work, you deserve to be in a cage. Um, in the city of Atlanta a few years ago, um, the city was trying to ban sex workers and put this whole thing out and was trying to do it secretly and um, community got word of it and it was we knew that it was going to primarily impact black women, trans women, queer people who are oftentimes doing survival sex work um, who make up a huge portion of the homeless population here and um, from that work we're able to um, combat it and from that that's where the Solutions Not Punishment Coalition was um, was birthed and that work continues to you know, they continue to do amazing things, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think where we see a lot of um, how the PIC hits the, hits the queer and trans community in particular, especially where race comes into play, um, is around the, you know, the criminalization of our bodies. And I think it's about, um, you know, um, for us who are not, who are gender non-conforming and who show up, you know, deep dykes all day, you know what I mean? And the, and the butchers and the studs and all of the people, I think that there's also an experience there that folks, um, you know, um, um, yeah, that there's also an experience there that folks are being profiled because you don't, you obviously you don't look like a lady, you don't walk like a lady. And so oftentimes, um, you know, we've heard from, different folks in our membership and the way they've experienced police violence is, you know, um, the misogyny uh, that comes up inside of a police interaction. Um, one of our comrades um, um, who's passed away now, uh, Juan Evans, remember one of the fights that we took on here in East Point, Georgia, it's because he was pulled over and um, a trans man and outside being called um, um, the N-word was also, um, the the police officer was trying to do a gender check right there on the street, you know, uh, and, you know, we <laughs> we wild out. We turned up. We turned up. But this happens all the time. Even in our current work, um, um, as we're doing these bailouts, we were struggling the first round with the Mama's Day bailout because we were like, we know trans folks is up in here. And the city of Atlanta um, tried to tell us that um, oh no, when a trans woman comes, gets locked up, she can tell us, you know, where she wants to be placed. And we are, you know, uh, so any trans woman that's in here, she's going to be on that, uh, that list of names that you all have pulled based on the FOIA that we, um, that we did. Uh, and we knew that wasn't the case. We were talking to the trans woman. They were like, no, when a trans woman gets locked up, um, based on if she has had 
surgery or not, if she has hair that can be removed or not. Like it's all based on the discretion of the person who's processing her. Um, and so this time we worked with different ones, uh, social workers and partners and people who were doing work inside of the, the jail and found two trans women that were being held at the Fulton County Jail. And um, both of them had two different stories on how their experience was. And one's was worse because she didn't pass. Um, but both were sitting in the men's prison, in the men's side. So, um, yeah, I think it shows up in, in, um, in terms of how queer and trans folks are impacted by the PIC, you know, around the criminalization. It has its, you know, nuances, but certainly when it comes down to, you know, uh, race and black and brown folks and being black, brown, queer and trans like that, um, you know, just takes it up a whole nother level.